what an amazing evening this has been. Um, things happening that I had no idea would happen. And, uh, you know, it, it's, you can quite e easily tell that I wasn't always sure exactly where I should be or what I should do. But anyway, um, I'm sorry I cannot speak German. But I wonder how many people here can speak chimpanzee. Probably not too many. So let me give you a greeting in chimpanzee, which you would hear if you came with me to those forests in Africa. And and that simply means, this is me, this is Jane. Every chimpanzee has his or her own voice. And because they travel around, sometimes alone, sometimes little family groups, sometimes a young one gets separated, wants to find the mother, so they give this call and then the mother will answer, that sort of thing. Well, uh, we've already heard about the importance of parents. And I always start my talks by giving enormous credit to my mother for what I've been able to do with my life. And she supported this love of animals that I was born with. And one day she came into my room. I was one and a half years old. And she found I'd taken a whole handful of earthworms to bed with me. And a lot of mothers would have, oh, throw these dirty things out, because of course I had the earth as well. But she just said, Jane, I think perhaps we'd better take them into the garden, because they might die if we leave them in your bed. And she said, told me later, I don't remember this at all, but she said, Jane, you were looking at them so intently, I think perhaps you were wondering, how do they walk without legs? <laughs> so that was maybe my first observation of animal behavior. When I was growing up, I'm probably one of the oldest people in this whole auditorium. I should think I'll be 90 next year. And I've seen... I've seen very many changes in my life over these 90 years, and they're not all good changes at all. But anyway, when I was growing up, um, there was no television. It hadn't been invented. There were no smartphones. There was no internet. There was nothing like that, no social media. And so for me, it was being out. We had a big garden, very little money. But when World War II broke out, Mom, me, and my sister went to live with her mother, and this was a house with a big garden. I used to spend my time out in the garden, watching the birds, the squirrels, the spiders, anything I could find. I spent a lot of time up my favorite tree. And the other thing I learned from was books. I always loved books. Mostly, they came from the library. We couldn't afford new books. and. I used to save up my few pennies of pocket money and spend Saturday afternoon in a little old second-hand bookshop. And I was 10 years old when I found this very small second-hand book, and it was called Tarzan of the Apes. I had just enough money to buy it. And of course, I fell passionately in love with this glorious lord of the jungle. And Little girls of 10 can be very romantic. <laughs> and what did Tarzan do? He married the wrong Jane. Right? <laughs> so anyway, I knew there wasn't a Tarzan, but that's when my dream began. I will grow up go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. So girls weren't scientists in those days. And everybody laughed at me. How will you get there? You don't have money. Africa's far away. We don't know much about it. It's full of dangerous wild animals and cannibals. And, and, and anyway, you're just a girl, not my mother. She said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't get up, give up, 
you'll find a way. And so I won't go into how I found the way, but it was hard work. I had to do a secretarial course to get some money. Then when I was invited to Africa, I had to work as a waitress. And I got out there, and I was fortunate enough to meet Dr. Louis Leakey, famous anthropologist, paleontologist. And somebody said, if you're interested in animals, you should meet Louis Leakey. And it was Louis Leakey who gave me the opportunity to go and live with and learn from not just any animal, but the one most like us. Chimpanzees share 98.6% of the structure of our DNA with us. And they're like us in so many other ways. It wasn't easy. For four months, the chimps ran away from me. They'd never seen a white ape before. <laughs> and they would just go into banishing the vegetation. And I only had money for six months. I mean, who was going to give money for this young girl going out into the forest? But eventually, we got money for six months. And four months went by before the chimps began to accept me. And once that happened, the Geographic Society agreed to fund the research into the future. I gradually began to find out more and more about these amazing beings, how like us they are in their behavior, kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another, begging for food, males swaggering upright when they compete for dominance, shaking their fists, just like some human male politicians, I think. <laughs> care of the infants and children by the mothers, uh, males patrolling the boundary of the territory and protecting the resources for their own families. I was shocked to find that they even have a dark and brutal side like us. They're capable of a kind of primitive warfare, but they also show love, compassion and true altruism. After I'd been with them one and a half years, I got a letter from Leakey saying, you have to get a degree, I want other scientists to take you seriously. And he got a place for me in Cambridge University to do a PhD. He said, there's no time for an undergraduate degree. <laughs> and so you can imagine I was very nervous. And can you imagine how I felt when so many of these professors, of whom I was rather nervous, told me I'd done everything wrong. Jane you, sh <clears throat> Jane, you shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. No David, Greybeard, Flo, Goliath, Fifi, and so on. You should have numbered them. That's science. And you can't talk about their personalities, of vivid personalities, though they have. And you can't talk about them having minds capable of problem solving, although it's very obvious that they do. And you certainly can't talk about them having emotions like happiness, sadness, fear, despair. All those things are unique to the human. And this is back in 1961. And honestly, at that time, science was teaching us that humans were on a pedestal. And there was a big gap between us and all the other animals. And it was the chimpanzees. I was able to show, it was like reaching out across this, this gap to the chimpanzees and them reaching back and holding hands. That eventually when the film footage of the chimpanzees began going around the world from my then husband Hugo van Lauwek sent by the Geographic, it was the combination of my careful observations and the film proving that what I said was true that science gradually changed its attitude towards animals and realized that we are part of and not separate from the rest of the animal kingdom. And so now students can study animal personality. They can study animal emotions. And most importantly of all, they can certainly study animal intelligence. And we know now, yes, you saw the elephants and there's chimpanzees, and there's whales, and there's dolphins, but there's intelligence. This, these little sheep, sheep can, are amazingly intelligent. Some of you must have seen my octopus teacher. And that, yes. It's, it's, so, you know, the octopus 
so different from us <clears throat> with one central brain. Brains in all eight arms, incredibly intelligent. And so now we have a different relationship with the other animals of the planet. But the one thing in which we differ most from the other animals is the explosive development of the human intellect. Just think what we've done. I mentioned earlier we didn't have TV, we didn't have smartphones, we didn't have the internet. Uh, we hadn't made a rocket that went up to the moon. And you know, please, next time you see a full moon, you probably just accept that yes, people have walked on the moon. But I remember that day when they actually set foot on the moon, looking up, and when I look up at the moon now, I think, wow, people walked up there. Just try it next time you see the full moon. Try and get that feeling of awe and wonder. Anyway, I got my PhD. I went back <laughs> to the forest, and they were the best days of my life, learning about the interconnection of all living things in the natural world. And I planned to spend, you know, the rest of my life there. And actually, the research is in its 63rd year. We have a group of students out there, and it's the longest study of any wild, one of the three longest studies of wild animals in the world. And we're still learning new things about the chimps. But, so why did I leave? I left uh, in 1986 when I discovered at a conference that I helped to put together that right across Africa forests were being destroyed and chimpanzee numbers were decreasing. And I went to that conference as a scientist, had my PhD, and I left as an activist. I didn't make the decision, something changed in me. I knew I had to do something, I had no idea what to do. Visited by then were six other chimpanzee research study sites. Learned a great deal about the problems facing the chimps, mostly habitat destruction, but also shooting mothers to catch babies to sell them for entertainment. And in those days, medical research and many other uses as well, like pets, which is a real shocking thing to take a baby chimp, bring it up as a child, and then, you know, what happens? They get dangerous, they get shut up in tiny cages. So, at the same time, I was learning about the problems facing so many of the African people living in and around chimp habitat. The crippling poverty, the lack of good education and health facilities, the spoiling of the land as human populations grew. And when I flew over the tiny Gombe National Park, where I've done the research since 1960, back then it was part of a great forest across Africa. By the late 1980s, it was a tiny island of forest surrounded by completely bare hills. And it was obvious that people were cutting down the trees in their desperation to survive, to make money from charcoal or timber to make more land, to grow more food, because their own farmland was overused and infertile. And so the Jane Goodall Institute started a program to try and alleviate their poverty, going into the villages around Gombe, as, not as a group of arrogant white people, but as we picked seven local Africans, they went into the villages and asked the people, what can we do for you? And that program has been so successful, it's come to include things like scholarships to enable girls to have secondary education. We even have some who've been through university. Microfinance, so that people can start their own small, environmentally sustainable businesses, and so much more. And it's been so successful. <laughs> successful. It's now in 104 villages throughout Chimp Range in Tanzania, and it's in six other countries where JGI studies chimpanzees. And I can now say proudly that there are chimpanzees alive today and trees standing today that wouldn't be there if this program hadn't started.
very responsible for this, George Strondon. Unfortunately, he had to go back um, to, for work, but his wife, Mie, is here. So, Mia, I want you to know how much I appreciate what George Strondon has done for the people of, of Africa. So, so, it was a lot of work getting money for all this program. And I was traveling around the world. And traveling around the world, I was learning about what we are doing to the planet. Here we are, the most intellectual creature that's ever walked on this planet. But we're not intelligent, we've lost wisdom. Wise, intelligent beings don't destroy their only home. And I'm sure many of you have seen... I'm sure many of you have seen photographs of planet Earth taken from space. That beautiful little green and blue globe surrounded by the dark, black, cold immensity of space. That is our only home. And we are destroying it. And I think, I think all of you know, you know the main problems like climate change and loss of species, along with pollution of air, land and water. The factory farms, and you saw two little lambs, but factory farms that cram billions of animals around the world in tiny spaces. Unbelievably cruel when you realize that every one of those animals has a personality and is capable of feeling fear and pain. And these factory farms also use pesticides and herbicides in growing food, and that is poisoning the very soil on which we depend, as well as having a horrible effect on biodiversity, species dying because of the poison, and it's making us sick. And so these intensive farms need to be phased out in place we need to build up small-scale family farms, permaculture, uh, regenerative agriculture. We know how to do it. We have the tools. Do we have the will? So, on a day of hope, a wonderful day when the sun shone and all these people gathered together showing that we know how to do it, showing what they're doing to make the world a better place. And we have a program, the JGI, for young people, Roots and Shoots, and these young people choose three projects to make the world better, one to help people, one to help other animals, one to help the environment, because everything is interrelated. And a program that began with 12 high school students in Tanzania, in Africa, is now in 68 countries and growing, and it has members in kindergarten, university, even some adults, and everything in between. These young people are my main reason for hope. They are changing the world. three reasons for hope. The human brain, we are finally beginning to turn our attention to finding ways of living in greater harmony with the natural world, like renewable energy, like machines that are sucking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, like, as I say, moving to a better kind of farming, like thinking about our own environmental footsteps every day. How do we live? in harmony with the natural world? Do we care? And more and more people are caring, which is a great reason for hope. More people caring, not always acting. That's the part we have to work on. And that, that gets better as people understand what they can do as individuals. Because so many people come to me and say, oh, what's going on in the world? It's so, so hopeless and I feel helpless. And people then tend to fall into apathy and do nothing. So I always say to them, just think what you can do in your community and get out there and take action, picking up trash or planting trees, whatever it is, take action. It'll make you feel good. Get your friends to join you. 
That's what the Roots and Toots kids do. And they're changing their parents too. So. And so using our brain, we can move towards a better world before it's too late. We don't have that long. And then my next reason for hope, which was already talked about, nature is forgiving, nature is resilient. Give nature a chance and she will recolonize places that we have destroyed. There are so many examples. You have one right here in Germany, the Heidelberg Cement Factory. They have quarries that are laid bare as they take the, the, the sand out for cement. But they've got a competition every year. And because people uh, go into these quarries, it's unbelievable how the life can come back to places that seem dead. So the resilience of nature. Animals rescued from the brink of extinction. And again here, you have the program to bring back the northern bald ibis, the wild drop. And I was with a group of them with their nests yesterday uh, with, with Oliver. And it was just the most amazing thing to see these birds building nests and they've learned their migration route. So there is hope. And then my final reason for hope is the indomitable spirit. There are people who tackle seemingly impossible projects, programs, and they succeed and they inspire others to join them. So those are my reasons for hope. And a day like today, bringing people together to share their, to share their, their own vision, to share their own programs, to share their excitement because they're succeeding. And now I hear this day is going to happen every year here in Bavaria. So congratulations to everybody who made this day possible. And I know it's going to make a huge difference and we need to do this all around the world. So thank you all for being here and inviting me to come and speak. <laughs>